I also thank Dr. Muttukumar Swami for agreeing to be here with us despite his hectic schedule. Friends, India has always been a melting pot, a conglomeration of mind-blowing number of cultures and traditions, a vastness that contains within it bewildering number of dialects, tongues, languages and language families. Each one of them can boast of hoary, distant, ancient and rich past, a lineage that can rival any of the face of earth. When one talks about diversity in terms of tongues, richness and diversity of dialects and languages, there are a small number of nations which can boast of equal diversification and density. But when it comes to a number of ancient cultural traditions encompassing entire human life, very few countries can come closer to India. The expressions of these cultural traditions in the languages developed and flourished in the subcontinent have remained by and large unwritten for much of our history. Not only India's but the roots of all civilizations across the globe spanning several millennia are to be found in the ancient and rich traditions. There is nothing tribal as the word is used in different sense among the urban, urban elites, especially in the western countries over the last few centuries at least. More often than not, these communities and literature they generated were the most ancient recordings of human history. Tribal and folk songs and other art forms of India present a range of depth and combination of fantastic imagination with lofty ideals. So, their value goes beyond their a mere record of events but also reflect development of minds and enrichment of culture. They contain within them some of the finest literary productions, loftiest of philosophies, outpourings at nature and human condition and yet all these have remained hidden from public eye from for about 2000 years now. Advancing invaders, cultural practices, change in education and economic conditions, arrival of English and their imperious educational systems meet the indigenous traditions of the country were sidelined over at least 500 years. Further, the rampant globalization and parolary change lifestyles have ensured that oral traditions, especially tribal ones, were marginalized thick and fast. These changes and declining interest in tribal traditions and their effectives were not merely limited to literature but point to a threatening and possible loss of ways of living or in a single world culture. Indigenous medicine systems, knowledge traditions, records of seminal events in history, stories, information about economy and technologies, poetry and various art forms would vanish if the tribal traditions were allowed to be marginalized in the same fringy manner. It is not all gloom and doom as it may appear to be, there are silver linings in terms of con continuing storytelling traditions, native medical practitioners and tribal poets who can mingle with nature as if it is organism and we were breathtaking songs. All tribal stories and songs are direct and actually the primordial expressions of first inhabitants who can be termed as pioneers of all literature. These pristine expressions may sound alien to the educated and smart urban inhabitants of modern world, but they are the truths told in simple forms. As you could listen, I am not using the word tribes to denote indigenous people, and throughout this address, if at all I use the word tribe, it would be only for the sake of ease of communication. In fact, the problem of representing indigenous people or communities begins the moment we call them tribes. You may say, what is in a name, even if you call them being crows by some other name, it will smell the same. But we should remember that naming is a way of classification. 
a method of categorization and a primary tool for creating social hierarchies. Especially when we call a group of people or communities, tribes, we immediately imply certain economic backwardness, geographical isolation, simple technology, lack of access to education, and amenities of contemporary life, contemporary modern life, and racial inferiority. This is problematic. The indigenous people of India have been part of the mainstream history as other peoples have been, and we need to recognize the contemporaneity of the indigenous communities. If at all, we were to represent them and their ingenuity in literature. I often hear that the hierarchical term, tribe, is the construct of our colonial past. If we were to read the public debates in the 1940s over very relevant policy recommendations for that, protection of indigenous populations of India, we would know that the history of indigenous people in India is the story of economic exploitation and cultural destruction caused by the pollution between the dominant caste society and the colonial powers. Very relevant held the view that the colonial rulers and the castes moneylenders and landlords were responsible for uprooting indigenous communities from their production systems and placing them within the present production network. As a result, they would neither benefit from the mainstream economic growth nor go back to their subsistence-based mode of production. The conditions of the tribals, quote-unquote tribals, according to Vary Erwin, were worse if they, were, if they lived in a Hindu caste area. Hairavari Karve, in her path-breaking reading of Mahabharata, Uganda, cites the episode of destruction of Kandava forest as the most paradigmatic event, meaningful even today, in understanding the exploitative and destructive relationship a casteist society and its state imposes on the lives of fragile indigenous people. In the Mahabharata episode, Krishna and Arjuna set up to burn down the Kandava forest to clear the land and they established the new city of Indraprastha. In the ensuing battle between the forest dwelling indigenous people, including Nishadas and the royal and the royal princess, they burned down the forest with the real people breathing inside them. Airavadi Karve interprets that the royal princess did not think twice before killing the people inside the forest because, as tribals, the people were beyond the four varnas, varna composition of the society, and so their lives did not merit the same consideration as that of the members of the four varna society. The colonial rulers appropriated and restructured these pre existing structures and social norms in Indian society and thereby introduced new attributes, meanings and applications in the communities they identified as tribes. The British colonial rule went to the extent of criminalizing and denotifying certain tribes and its shameful legacy still continues, despicably continues in southern India's commercial films, television shows even today. One would immediately remember the real-life incident of lynching an Indian innocent tribal young man, Madhu, in Kerala in the recent times. Despite the protection guaranteed by the Articles 342 and 360, 366 of the Indian Constitution, which are also known as the Articles of Definition and Security for the Schedule with Tribes, the indigenous population of India is the most displaced one in the world and that too in the post-independent modern history of India. From the displacement of the Gundi tribe for the construction of Narmada Dam to the forced movement of Jainapurva tribe for building the Kabini Dam and the river Kaveri, the indigenous communities of India have paid a hefty price for the development of Indian economy and its prosperity. The recent resistance of Dongriya Khon community of the Niamagiri Hills against the powerful corporate Vedanta 
to excavate bauxite from their land is another contemporary tale of O that tells us the struggles tribes of India face today. Besides the loss of land and, and property, the significant crucial loss is the disappearance of tribal languages, post flight displacement and migration. That reminds me that both and the Dongriyakon languages belong to the Dravidian family of languages and it is crucial that we identify the indigenous communities by their languages rather than by their regions. Given the numerous problems faced by the tribes of India, the historians of tribal communities have for long concentrated on the theme of protest movements and, and rebellions, reconstructing the tribal histories from documentary evidence. I tend to think these historical studies studies are essential for representing the tribal communities. However, these studies have limitations when we think of transferring them to literature. For instance, when we go through the historical studies on Birsa Munda and the struggles of Santal people, we get to read fascinating historical accounts, but we, don't, we do not know anything about how these histories and heroes of struggle affect and shape the contemporary life of Sanda. Similarly, we do not know whether very relevant anthropological account, life in a Goan village or leaf from a jungle, would still be relevant narratives for the contemporary life in the Vastar region. Moreover, the historical accounts of the tribal struggles have mostly attempted to present them as autonomous subaltern protests. Recent researches which blend history, anthropology, and the scholars and the sociology of development have interpreted tribal communities as groups inhabiting liminal zone between nature and culture, as Dr. Srinivasarao also pointed out in his welcome address, culture and nature and culture, and have given rise to hybrid histories of what Nandini Sundar terms anthropological history. There are also emerging studies on childhood, identity, and gender on a tribal communities. What is interesting in these studies is that they do not treat all the tribes of India as one undifferentiated whole, but each community as having unique indigenous features. I am of the opinion that capturing the unique native features of the community is the right way of representing them in literature. History of its documented history to manifest in drapes, tupatas, tablecloths, stoles, kurtas, pajamas, skirts, pants, jackets, and salwar kurta, other than the traditional kutu which is a shawl, its original place of majesty. For the Koda women and men wearing an embroidery shawl, it's not only a matter of aesthetic choice, but it is also a way of way of carrying oneself with a dignity. Each life cycle ceremony of Toda culture demands a particular embroidered design on the shawl, and the embroidery embroidered shawl complements and completes the carefully constructed aesthetic ecosystem of their environment. Surrounded by the stone circles of megalith burial sites on hilltops, about 2,000 Todas live in 69 helmets. The traditional Toda helmets consist only of 6 to 7 per cut. Constructed with the bamboo and patched grass, the hamlets have spaces for buffalo diary and a cluster of hamlets would have a barrel vaulted and conical shaped temple. Only in a life cycle ceremony such as the pregnancy ceremony, which demands the presence of half a dozen particular plants and flowers, one sees that all the required plants and flowers are very much there in the hamlet itself, and they are coming alive to establish an aesthetic continuum along the embroidered shawl. No wonder Yamano draws parallels between the structures of Toda language and the rituals and the life cycle of ceremonies. Yamano's study is very interesting because he makes a syntactic uh, similarity. The, 
finds the synthetic similarities between Toda embroidery, the ecosystem of flowers and plants, and the lifestyle of the people, the ritual life cycle of the people. A flower is an epistemological tool in Toda thinking, and seasons, patterns of thought, buffalo behavior, emotions such as worries and monsoon rains are named and measured after flowers. Yamano's monumental work, Toda Songs, further reveal the extensive, extensive Toda knowledge of flowers and nature in general. Toda daily life reflects the aspects of nature in many ways. Their houses are arranged in rainbow patterns. Their curious cane stick is modeled, even a small cane stick is modeled after a flower. Even the miniature Toda churning stick resembles the petals of a flower. It is a, so, I want to re reiterate that flower is an epistemological tool in Torah thinking. But if you look at the Sangam poetics, in Sangam poetics also, the flower is an epistemological tool for arrangement and the classification of, of ancient Tamil poetry. So there is a similarity between the lifestyles of Torah and what is described in Sangam literature, but we haven't made the connections between the lifestyle and the <coughs> interpretation of our ancient literature. Curiously for a flowery universe, that too for the embroidery named as Pugu, Pugu, one discovers very few floral designs, designs in Doda embroidery. Restricted to crimson and black, we see that the Doda embroidery for sun, moon, snakes, squirrel, rabbits, buffalo horn as prominent motifs and designs and not a flower. So we haven't organized any uh, in the southern part so far. So uh, except one Kodava language long ago we organized in Karnataka. Of course Kodava Academy is there in the government of Karnataka as Kodava Academy. But there are many other tribal languages. Uh, any of scholars who are present here, any tribal languages kindly give information to the Academy and uh, we are ready to organize uh, programs in that particular language. And I thank you very much once again for your very uh, brilliant keynote address. Now, I request the chairperson of this inaugural session, Dr. Sirifi Barasok Mandanchi, to address this August gathering. Uh, before that, uh, of course, uh, all of you know about him, but uh, the convention I will briefly introduce him. Presently, is the director of uh, Orchel War, Dr. N. Mahalingam Translation Institute at Pallachi. Pallachi. And Dr. Sirpiji has uh, 76 published works to his credit in different genres like poetry, biography and translations. And has also edited a few literary journals until date. 14 books have been written on Dr. Sirpi Balasubhamanyam and is a recipient of uh, many awards and honors that include Sahit Academy Award, Sahit Academy Translation Prize, Pavendra Award and the card. Kali Mami Award of uh, Tamil Nadu government among others and Dr. Sirpi Parasuman has also founded a literary body called Sirpi Foundation which aims at encouraging good poetry writing particularly for the youth and presently is also the convener of Sahit Academy's Tamil Advisory Board, Dr. Sirpi Parasuman. He has written a poem, Gandhi and Poetry, wherein Gandhiji shoots question after question, question after question to his visitor poetry regarding the origin and purpose of poetry. Poetry answers, I am born in a forest on the tongue of a hunter and brought up in the hut of a fisher, fisherwoman. The references are to Ramayana of Valmiki and Mahabharata of Vyasa, summing up the view that even the greatest of the epics are products of the ancient tribal law. According to Sahya Singh Chopra, tribe means a group of people living in a particular place from time immemorial. Tribes' identities are differently named at different places according to their geographical positioning, their social stratification in the society, and so in which makes them distinctive from others. It is said that India has 
the second largest concentration of tribal population after that of the African continent. The central, the south and the northeast parts of India are inhabited by a large number of tribal communities with their primitive traits and distinctive culture. It is rightly said that the development of literature and of different art forms in tribal communities predated the emergence of literature, predated the emergence of literature and arts in the so-called mainstream society. Until recent times, the creative literary output of the tribal communities was largely ignored. The reasons are many. The very existence of the tribal people is threatened and they have to struggle hard against the systematic exploitation and increasing discrimination. Their literature is mainly oral and their mainstay is in the unsophisticated folk languages of the tribal world. The ignorance of hundreds of indigenous languages of the various tribal communities stood in the way of our understanding the yearnings of their soul. But for the socio-political movements, the life and death problems of these ancient communities would not have seen the light of the day. According to a survey, the throwing open of India to the exploiters of the world by globalization and economic liberalization, the wanton loot of water, forests and land, the prime resources of the tribals, has already taken a toll of the lives of tribal communities. The rapid industrialization and the greed for the exploitation of natural resources like forest products, minerals and water has led to deforestation and virtual plunder of tribal wealth. The eco-friendly, peaceful and harmonious lifestyle of the tribal people has been paralyzed beyond redemption in the name of economic prosperity of the country. With dams are being built in the hills and forests, destroying the ecosystem forever denying the children of nature the very survival. Kaveri Dam in Himalayas and the Narmada Dam in Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh have brought to the fore the plights of Adivasis and hill tribes. Sundarlal Bhagavad and Medha Patkar, though failed in their attempts to save the tribal communities, stirred the consciousness of mankind in this respect. The efforts of Mahasveda Devi and Shivaram Karan will ever be remembered by the tribals with whom they were not only sympathetic but shared their problems living with them in the hills and forests. Arundhati voice, though harsh, was echoing the truth when she said, with them or to a nation's development what nuclear bombs are to its military arsenals. They are both weapons of mass destruction, she said. It is an irony that when the constitution guarantees the people the freedom to live in their own traditional ways, the guardians of the constitutions are busy evacuating the tribal communities from their traditional dwellings. They warned from the distant past. The hills and the forests were warned by the tribal community from the distant past when the mainstream life was not yet bigger. The first attempt to classify and record the manners and customs of the castes and tribes of South India was made by the Ethnographic Survey of India constituted by the Government of India in 1901. Edgar Thurston, with the help of L.K. Ananda Krishnaya, N. Subramani Ayyar and K. Rangachari, investigated the characteristics of 300 castes and tribes of South India 
and brought, our, brought out his monumental work, Castes and Tribes of South India, in 1909. Since then, some committed scholars have tried to unravel the mysteries and miseries of the tribal communities. But the culture which traditions enshrined in tribal literature is yet to be heard or read by general public. Social activities and prominent personalities have come forward to introduce us to tribal literature. It is a welcome feature to note the journals like Yudharat Am Atmi Delhi, Aravali Utkos Udaipur, Jharkandi Basa Sahitya Ranchi, Adivasi Sattva Chhattisgarh have devoted themselves to the tribal literature discourse. The first novel, Kochetati in Malayalam, Sinaka Kochetati. The first novel, Kochetati in Malayalam by Adivasi Narayan is a notable contribution to tribal literature. It is said that Narayan, who belongs to the Malayalaya tribal community in Kerala, was irked by fanciful and romantic representations of the tribal life and decided to write an authentic novel depicting how these children of nature were mistreated by the ruling class, the bureaucracy and religious zealots. Narayan says, most of the incidents in the book are based on real incidents that I remember and what I garnered from my elders' experiences, especially what my great-grandfather recounted of his life. Mahasveda Devi, a devoted social worker and writer, has said, Kochetati, one of the first tribal novel, novels, is a remarkable work and should be translated into other Indian languages. The work has been translated into English by Catherine Tangama and I hope Sahitya Academy will take up the translation work in other Indian languages. Sahitya Academy, the national conscience of India, has already developed a project of Indian literature in tribal languages and oral traditions to introduce the literature to the reading public of India and this venture is a major step in presenting the unheard voices of India to the people of India. The Irulas As far as the tribal literature of the tribes of Tamil Nadu are concerned, the Kotas, Sodas, Irulas, Kurumbas, Padagas and Paliyans, special mention must be made of the novel Cholagar Toti of Bala Murugan, he has come here. Bala Murugan, published in 2004. The novel, first of its kind in Tamil, speaks about the trials and tribulations of a community known as Solagar living near Dalavadi, up above the town of Satyamangala. The blood, sweat and tears of the Solagar community flows like a muddy river throughout the story. They are caught between the devil, the sandalwood weir of one, and the deep sea, the ruthless police, the land grabbers and money lenders, not to speak of the unmindful governments. Like many other tribal communities, Solagars are also worshippers of nature. Even when they dig for tubers, they used to take what is required for their food and leave a chunk to grow a guy. When they gather honey, they take care to leave a piece of honeycomb intact for the honeybee's food. Live and let live is the policy of tribal communities. There are many poignant scenes in the novel. An aged grandfather of the community is walking through the forest with his little granddaughter. On the way, they see a skeleton mass of an elephant. The child asks the grandfather, Tata, why do they kill the elephant? The old man says, Dear, they kill the elephant to take away the ivory tusks. The child prompts further, Tata, 
what will they do with the elephant tusk? With a sad voice, the grandfather replies, darling, with the tusk, they will make elephant toys. What a paradox that singes our heart. Solagar Tundi needs to be translated in other Indian languages and I do hope Sahitya Academy will take interest in this novel. Two years earlier to this novel, tribal literature in Tamil got a Philip from Indran's translation of some tribal poem from all over India. The title of the work was People Born Before God, Kadavulukku Muthi Parandavar. The poems throb with the anxieties, fears, struggles, joys and a sense of pride. In one of the poems, an Adivasi poet from Jharkhand declares, When did Shiva was born? Can you tell me? When did Jesus was born? Can you tell me? We were here even before gods were born. We were here even before gods were born. Gods were born only a long time after we were born. They were born from amongst the human beings. We were born before gods were born. Presenting their research paper here. Our sincere thanks to all participants who will make this event very interesting and interactive. I wish to record my sincere thanks to Dr. K. M. Subramanian, Registrar in Search, Tamil Nadu Open University, and all faculty members and administrative staff. I wish to record my sincere thanks to all members of Tamil Advisory Board of Sakit Academy and officials of Sakit Academy. Once again, I wish to record my very sincere to every one of you present here. Thank you. Manamartha Nandi.